right? So as soon as that campaign was over, it was right into Valentine's Day, Valentine's Day into Mother's Day, Mother's Day into Father's, Fourth of July, back to school, right? Like you see where I'm going with this? So as soon yeah, as yeah. we understand that that list is so large that we just need to reframe like, hey, you already bought from us. We already have your images. Guess what? Um, how about, how would you like this product? Um, whether it's a mug, whether it's a similar product like that, like reframing the offer to those that have already purchased from you. And welcome to The Robust Marketer. Today, I have a friend of mine and yet another repeat guest on the show. We have Nick Shackelford. Uh, Nick, uh, if you didn't catch the previous lesson, Nick is just basically a Facebook uh, legend, a true black belt operating at the 0.001% of Facebook operators out there spending huge dollars. He started in the brand space with Apple and PepsiCo. He founded Fidgetly with his partner, and now he works for Common Thread Collective, where he heads up a lot of their really cool brand initiatives. Working with what I like, what I like to now qualify like the top performance marketing brands, like the really performance brands, helping them achieve massive scale. Uh, this is a long intro, but he also is going to be on stage in Barcelona at Ecommerce Mastery Live. Uh, we're also going to announce a really cool partnership we're working on with Ecommerce All Star Secrets. Uh, where he's producing a lot of great content for us. Welcome to The Robust Marketer. How are you doing, Nick? I'm very, very well. Wow, that was probably the most thorough introduction that I'm going to save that. And anytime anybody asks what I do, I'm just going to play this. Just play like, that. Every, I'm like, this is what I do. Eric did it much better than me. Well, yes, this is my second time back, and I'm, I'm very, very excited because we've, we've been doing a lot of things, right? There's yeah. been a lot of things going on right now. It's summer. You can tell business is speaking up because everything's hot outside. So yeah. everyone's wanting to move and groove and spend on social. And we both decided to wear our white hats, which is just great. I've been growing my beard out after, with uh, with Nick's, Nick's advice. I got to say too, I called Nick Shaq all the time because we're working with another Nick that we're about to announce as well. Uh, and so to keep the Nick's, the Nick's uh, like, you know, apart, I like to call him Shaq, reminds me of, he just, just rocks the rim when it comes to Facebook ads. Oh, man, uh, I try, I try. But I yeah, think I'm gonna double back down on, you said, brands that are focusing on direct response that aren't trying to do it slyly. I think that's the biggest thing is because as more brands get more savvy, obviously I started in the brand space, but they weren't deploying capital smartly looking for like return top line, bottom line, right? Now it's more of like how do these direct response brands use like transactional content that forces people down funnels versus just hoping and relying on winning on discounts or price. Because it's something that we talk about. It's a huge focus of Everybody's like, acquire, acquire, acquire. Yeah, I love acquiring, but how about like keeping who you have? Yeah, yeah, we're going to get there. I want to I want to start by talking about the case study. We're just about to put out a case study. Maybe when this comes out, the case study will be out uh, that Nick Nick produced uh, for us that was basically around a brand called Pup Socks that allow you basically, it's, it's a case study where you show you scaled to 4X return on ad spend on a million dollar spend, 3.8 across 1.5 million. Just ridiculous numbers, and I just was reading in the in the case study just now. Did they come to you with this request that they wanted four X ad spend? Yes, actually they did. So that's crazy. The, the backstory is like Zach Zoner, their their founder and entrepreneur, had this fantastic idea, and he already had an account kind of going, like doing some boosted posts. And I've talked about this before, but he basically said, "Success to me is four X at a million dollar spend." And we all looked at each other internal. Like I know Taylor, our founder, was. With him, he's like, "Can you do this?" I was like, "Of course I can do this. Let me let me get let me get my swing at it. Let me get my team at it." But realistically, that's probably the the stupidest promise I've ever made in my life because it did a lot of things. One, it I lost all my sleep over Q4. Right, it was within a month period of time. But spending that tremendous amount of dollars on unproven accounts, on unproven creative, like you had an idea, like, okay, this looks good, as you'll see in the, the case study, why it worked, the main reasons why, but if we weren't pulling the right levers as we needed to, to like the tactics all the way to get to that much spend, not even, let alone the return, just to get to that much money is insane. It's, it just, it shows you that like, it, like the fact that he came in with this ex set an expectation is gonna, you shouldn't let your other clients hear this, by the way. You should be like, <laughs> oh, I would just be like, well, get Shaq to do eight, they, eight times they, ROI. Oh, we get that talk to like, well, they did this. I'm like, okay, let me explain how we did this and why we did this right time and then all of us 
it's just good planning. That's really what it comes down to. We did. We had really good planning. My team was on point, and it was good execution all the way around. Really. The the thing that you know we're you, in this space, this education space. There's a lot of people out there who sell systems and sell blueprints and sell. This is your step by step system for dropshipping success. All that stuff. We've never gone that way. We've always been a sort of skills based team. All we, we've sort of always been trying to let people know about the realism of how this stuff actually gets done. And and then reading your case study, it was like. It's it's sexy because it's a it's an amazing story, but it just it comes down to mass systematic testing, right? Yep. It comes down to like testing yep. in a really systematic way and just like hammering it sort of. System. I was amazed at the the systems that you put in place to to be able to to, to check your, your your the lift that you're going to get over the course of a 28 day attribution window, oh. so that you could then spend reliably, knowing that a lot more was going to trickle in. Yeah, it's huge. I mean, you don't. It's it's hard to really get this much data to understand what that lift will be. 20 days later because we as media buyers look at a day-to-day basis day-to-day basis and we don't even think about how much you can actually spend because if you're not thinking about what you can spend 28 days then you're making premature decisions right that's just what it comes down to it you could be allowing yourself to try there's a plan yeah lax lax baby i know right here um, so what what i meant to say is if you're, you're making premature premature decisions and you don't understand what the lift you're going to get after a full default 28 day last uh, 20 day youth you're lit, you're leaving you're taking dollars off the table essentially right because you could be spending more knowing that you can cut a little later at your metric your whatever your success metric is because you know you're going to get that back in 28 days nice and you actually link in this case study to a spreadsheet that other people can can model and use themselves oh yeah there's an easy way of determining like what your like repurchase rate is and what your lift is going to be and i actually walked through it a couple of times in in uh in the more of the course but yes very cool uh yeah so so let's talk a little bit of that we're releasing this case study on top of that we have dubbed you an e-commerce all-star you're one of our six all-stars uh and you're handling um facebook ads uh from a from from a, a testing and scaling perspective i know that's in there but also from a, a, a bringing customers back in perspective, from a remarketing, um, from a, a, a from a re- retention and frequency standpoint. So let's talk a little bit about that. What's we can out it here? What's your magic tool to, to, to help you understand when to hit people up, how often, and etc. Oh, for sure. so magic tool is understanding your repurchase rate. Like at its core, is what is your repurchase rate? How many? Between a period of time for you choose three months, six months, a year, how often is that original purchase coming back? Original purchaser coming back and spending with you? Because the tool that we use to kind of automate it, because I do show how to do it manually, but I then go, well, why would you waste your time if you can do it already with a tool? And that tool is Glue. So Glue is this magical gift that they've given us to determine how often someone's going to buy, at what point are they going to fall off, and then what kind of message should you be communicating with them? Because if you, have, if you have one consumer only spending a certain amount of dollars with you, they need to be treated versus someone who spent hundreds of thousands of dollars with you, right? That's the biggest takeaway is using this tool to its best ability and building specific communication funnels. And, and I think it's one of those things too. It's like it's not immediately obvious. I know they have some presets within there about how to pull certain kinds of data sets out. Essentially, it combines your Shopify data with your Facebook ads data and allows you to create right. really smart segments essentially. But having someone guide people through actually how to do this for their business, giving them exact concrete examples, this is the kind of thing you should be pulling out, this is the kind of thing you should be pulling out, I think will be really helpful for people. For sure, because I think it's, you have the tool, but then you have the platform, not just a platform, then you have the, the creative, right? So it's all three of those elements of understanding, okay, here's how, how do I use this? Like what aspect, where do I put this? What's the communication language around this type of customer? And pulling a couple of examples really gets the ball rolling because what I'm not trying to do is show you the blueprint, right? Like what you said, but I'm trying to show you the framework of thought so that you can apply it to what your brand is. You have different brands. I have different margins. I have 17 brands I need to do this for. And as long as you have the thought work through it, you can pop up as many brands as you want. Yeah, exactly. I wanted to ask you about the brands that you guys work with. You know, if, if someone comes in and they're just like a dog of a brand, not a pup socks, but like a brand, like how do you know when, like when you're going to take a client on? Like what gets you excited about, about a client specifically? Okay, great question. So this is actually a question I get asked a lot from a lot of people. 
and it's mainly around what am I interested in? And it's, I'm interested in a couple of different areas. So first I'll talk to you about what are the requirements of someone to kind of be taken on a common thread. Um, proven funnel. Uh, we, we definitely enjoy brands that understand who, the, who their customers are, right? Because what, what we really focus on is speaking to specific personas within your whole brand because you have different reasons why different people like who you are, okay? So if you as a brand come in and go, we know consumer A, B, and C are our guy, okay? We'll, we'll take those understandings and start building out specific formulas or funnels all the way through, speaking to them, communicating to them, but at the end of the day, they're still buying the same products, right? That's the beauty of Facebook is you understand you can use it as a tool to determine specific personas within one brand. So we'd like to have somebody with an idea already coming into us, willing to be able to spend to understand that they need to buy that data. There's no easy way of doing it, right? If everything lines up, you get a pup socks where they come into a, a, a massive return in a short period of time. But for a lot of the other brands, we sit there, we ideate back and forth and try to get to them and try to get them to understand that there's time that we need to spend to develop who your ideal customer is. Or else we're just spending money without any processes and that's not what we want to do. Do they need to have Facebook data built up ahead of time? It makes it easier. It really does. It'll, it'll focus the spend. If I, That's the easiest way I can put it because there are going to be dollars in testing product, in testing audiences. You're always going to have some wasted spend. Again, I don't call it waste. I call it buying the data because you learn not to put more money there. Um, yeah. But it does make it a lot easier. If you're already in an existing funnel with something built out or if you just have a firm stance in who you are as a brand and understand, okay, I know who we are. I'm going to spend till we get to what we need to do. Very cool. What's, what's your funding strategy for doing a mil, for spending $1.5 million in 30 days or whatever? Is it all, is it on credit? So, you, 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 yeah. How do you work that? So you, a, you, it's a communication with your credit card company. So Zach, as soon as I told Zach, Hey, this thing's going to light off. Like, please call um, your bank and please get that credit line. They don't trust you, dude. You don't just go from spending a couple thousand a day to a million in a month. So Zach had to get a funding source, communicate that he had like this financial backing, and then go uh, directly contact Facebook to do a direct line of credit because they they didn't trust us putting that much money on the credit card. No, I bet not. <laughs> yeah. Plus, we had four we had four ad accounts. So suspicious. The amount of times the website went down, the amount of times uh, the uh, credit card went down because we're spending on four ad accounts. We had a battle with a lot of these things and restarting, as everybody knows, is not the best thing to do when you're scaling. Yeah. There must have, must have been a, quite a hairy situation scaling there because it's not a simple uh, – if people go check out pupsocks.com. It's not just a, hey, buy this product. It's, hey, I got to upload a picture of my dog. Then the picture has got to go to a designer, I guess, who's going to cut out the face. As well. Also, like scaling this must have been a hairy operation for everyone involved. Whoa, oh, my gosh. So here's the three things that happened. So when you – so on like the technical side of scaling this brand, so we, we realized real quick, mobile's the way to go. Everybody has pictures of their dogs on mobiles, no brainer. But the functionality of actually doing like uploading the picture on the phone is a little bit time consuming. Think about having that much traffic driving to a site. Everybody's uploading. Everybody's trying to check out. Everybody's trying to process. We were on, I think, Dropbox's biggest storage plan for all the images because they have all those images. Everything you uploaded, they have. It's stored somewhere. But we had to move to AWS, some crazy server system, just to handle the uploads, not to mention the processing of payments. Unreal. Oh, man. It was, it was Zach and me like, yeah, I know. I see. Yeah, I got it. Two minutes later, bro, we're going. We're going every single minute. What an, was it the craziest scale? The crazy, like, was it the craziest scale you've done or was that, was that with Fidgetly? Like, where, what, what's the craziest scale you've been a part of? Neither of those. Okay, well, so it's crazy scale. The way I understand that is tied to a period of time and a dollar's amount spent. There you okay, go. Okay, so what we're currently doing, so a million dollars in a month, that's that's a great scale. Obviously, that's that's um, that's well done at that return. Anybody can spend money without a return, right? That's true. But I think the most recent one we did, and I think we're currently doing it, doing another one today, is for a really, really great brand that's direct response focused. I talked about it um, in this chat is we scaled from in a week to about uh, $295,000 in one week at a 1.6 return on Shopify. Wow. So that was a week period of, and we only sp we spent a third obviously of a mil, but that going from $3,000 a day to $250,000 a day was unbelievable. Unreal, and, they, and, and again, you picked them, 
something about the brand. They also sold you on their funnel. They, they, they told you about the, the success of their funnel existing. And that was one of the main reasons that you knew this had the potential. Oh yeah. We knew that it's a product. It was a, it was a great offer for one. We knew that it was going to convert. Uh, the period of time was less competition. It was in March and, um, we had been, we had been prospecting really strategically up to the point where the launch was going to happen. What I mean by that is we were lowering the amount of dollars we spent on new marketing and a current customer win back because we just wanted new people into the funnel so that when that offer did go live, we could slam it, right? We weren't hitting them so much. As soon as they got into the, the period of time, we were able to just slam the dollars into people that were familiar with the brand so we didn't have to sell them too much, right? Yeah. Very cool. So. I want to talk, we, we released this infographic that you and I talked quite a little bit about, and it just basically correlated, you know, people with higher return uh, customer rates and the amount of revenue made. It was a direct correlation. The more repeat customers you have coming back, but the thing, but the other graph that we showed was that less than five people have more than 2%, less than 5% of people who we surveyed had more than 2% returning customer rate. So it's still a huge, huge opportunity for people. I wanted to ask a little specifically with pup socks in mind. You don't have to give me their strategy or anything, yeah, but what, what would be some of the, the remarketing and frequency based tactics that you would advise for a company like, like pup socks that had this huge, huge win would, did you, did they, for instance, come back with a father's day campaign to be like, Hey, get your dad on a pair, get, get, get your grandkid on a pair of socks or something like what's an actual strategy that you might employ for a company like pup socks, which is like a novelty type product as right. to like when to remarket to them. It's a great question because. When, when you say win back campaign or frequency retention or any of these fancy words to just saying reoffering mm -hmm. your product to them, it's just a matter of uh, offer rotation. So understanding where your brand is. So a brand that you have said like Pup Socks, they need to take advantage of holiday time, right? So as soon as that campaign was over, it was right into Valentine's Day, Valentine's Day into Mother's Day, Mother's Day into Father's, Fourth of July, back to school, right? Like you see where I'm going with this? So as soon yeah, as yeah. we understand. That, that list is so large that we just need to reframe like, hey, you already bought from us. We already have your images. Guess what? Um, how about, how would you like this product? Um, whether it's a mug, whether it's a similar product like that, like reframing the offer to those that have already purchased from you. One thing that you don't know about is as soon as we realized how successful Pup Socks was, we actually made facesocks.com. So facesocks.com was a second website that we just turned in and now Facebook is unbelievably, unbelievably pushing past on a year-round basis in where Pup Socks was. It's interesting. We didn't know this at the time. But now having human faces on everything, we can really frame around boyfriend, girlfriend. We can really frame around um, anniversary, weddings, right? That's right. Year-round. I would have thought I thought people like dogs more than they like people, but I guess not. That's, uh, that's good to know. There's, there's hope for us yet. Yes, there is. People still like humans. That's uh, that's awesome. Okay, so so that would be a strategy for them to bring them back there. What are you but, currently like? What are you currently most fired up about in your job? Like, what are you? What like what what aspect of marketing and and e-commerce are you most fired up about right now? Wow, that was such a good question. So right now, what we're doing is we're having a lot of early conversations planning for Q4. It is not too soon to be doing this because what we work with now is understanding that we don't have drop shipping clients. We have clients that have inventory. So every single person that we're having conversations with is planning for inventory. Now it doesn't sound sexy. It doesn't sound something that you enjoy to do, but if they don't have that part right, there's no way you're going to be able to spend any dollars coming into the peak buying time. So we're, all my conversations right now is like, okay, what is the offer we're doing for Black Friday? We're starting much sooner because what people don't realize is when a new campaign or a new offer goes off, it, why would you introduce a brand new offer with a brand new creative that has no social proof? You have to start winning all these auctions again and it's not proven. So what we like to really focus on is we know if this ad has so much social proof, it's already winning auctions, let it run through. So we're applying that thinking to the offer we want to run for Black Friday and already have it running a month to two months before, just acquiring that social proof. Smart. Yeah, so social proof is just a must, right? Like you've got to build that into your funnels. Yeah, because again, you these infographics, right? The reason why it's so much focus is on acquisition 
is because they're not taking care of customer support. They're not taking care of focusing on the customer relationship. They're just like, I need to get to my Churning and burning. I didn't like the quality. I apologize. Buy this one too. That's exactly right. That, that thought process of not having a growth mindset. Delayed. So we have delayed attribution. It's delayed gratification in building a brand. And that's what it takes. Oh my gosh. You know this. You know this. Yeah. When, if it's going to be sustainable and you want it to be around, something that you can – my focus is on building brands that can be sold. It needs to be able to win back multiple customers, right? I agree. So that's a cool point you bring up, building brands – to be sold, and this is something we're trying to do with all the the e-commerce training that we're that we're putting out here is giving you know giving people that mentality of having a holistic strategy, not not just jumping in for the quick buck. Because if you do that, you're going to miss things. You're you're not going to see the whole invisible architecture that goes into you know into into funnel marketing. I was having a really cool talk with uh, someone yesterday, and they say the word funnel is such a broad word. Like funnel means your Shopify store. It means your email sequence. It means your remarketing sequence. It means your yeah. Facebook ads. And like so many people have a very narrow definition of funnel. And the more the more like all encompassing like your your funnel is. And the more you broaden your definition of funnel to include the moment, you know, a customer sees your brand to, to, to the moment they die really is, is, you know, what you should be thinking of. It, of course. So what you're saying is it's customer life cycle journey, right? Everybody. So our boy, Mo, Mo loves funnels. Yep. Mo's, Mo is funnel. Mo is funnel. Like Mo is foe. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll pay it. Honestly, I'm sitting here going like, okay, everything we do is a funnel, right? By the time you, like you said, everything, once you enter and then where they are in that journey, they have their own mini funnels throughout the entire journey. But understand that it, it begins with that first touch point. And then as soon as they get the product, that's the next touch point. And how are you engaging and cons keeping that consistent? Yeah. That's how you're going to build long, long-term value in this whole thing. So one of the things that you also hit on in your case study, it was sort of like, it was funny. It was like thrown on there as a, I was like, oh yeah, and by the way, once we had w stuff working, we knew we knew which ads were working, we knew how we scaled, we knew this product, people loved it. You, you started to make some influencer deals at that time, and you kind of threw that oh, in yeah. there. Is that is that your is that basically where you see influencer marketing fitting into the into the ecom journey? Is like you really you sort of like you run your ads, you know, you figure out what works, and then it gives you that amazing you like lead in to go to someone like an influencer to help scale it. For sure, I think it depends on your thought process of like what scale is. So we, we engage with influencers, and I know Greta does an unbelievable job about speaking on this, so I'll let her go the nitty-gritty on it. But way, the way we look at influencers, and I had a conversation today with a brand who corrected me as I was seeing why we like influencers. She goes, oh, we don't pay for posts. Like, no, it's okay. We're not, we're not here to pay for posts. We're here to access their audience, right? Because all we're thinking about is scale. Yeah. So we're thinking about scale. We're not thinking about the incremental dollars we have to pay for them to post on their page. Because a brand's gonna go, nah, that's, they love us enough to wanna to post about us. Of course, everybody loves your brand, your brand's the best. But what we want is another audience that is technically, you're buying a warm audience because that influencer is gonna to speak to the people that follow him or her. So when we access an audience or an influencer, we're using it as a, a, a way to run ads through that. And people do this all the time because CPMs consistently for influencers are much cheaper. Because it's more a, it's more authentic coming from uh, indiv individual speaking on behalf of a brand. So this is great, get it versus a brand going, I am great, come get me. Nice. Do you ever build the influencer into the funnel as well? Like, I guess that would be that's an you know because I'm just thinking of influencers being the start of the funnel basically. Um, have you ever built anything where then the influencer is then a deeper part of the funnel as well, like on the landing page, for instance, in order to create continuity? I guess that you'd have to make sure that it would really depend on the brand, I guess, in that case. No, I think you're absolutely correct. There's multiple ways of introducing uh, influencer at the part of the funnel. So something we've been dabbling on, we haven't been able to execute it yet because it is a large undertaking plus long contract. Because usually the deals that we make are, I'll talk deeper about this, like kind of when I get on stage in Barcelona, but... You ink a deal, it's for a piece of content for a duration of time, um, and then you get, you either doing a ref share or you're doing some sort of um, straight up payment and they just give you access and they shut it off. But getting access to them to actually be on your lander, that's a huge, that's now a digital asset that we have to pay tremendous dollars for. Mm. So we only like to kind of use an influencer, whether they're introducing a brand or they're going to 
then be sold with a product on white or a lifestyle image. And then again, back down to like a DPA. But there's also times where we'll hit huge, great brand piece, solidify that with an influencer because the way people buy is for two reasons. One, the price of it and two, a recommendation from someone they trust. Mm. And then after, as soon as they get after this, then they're seeing some very simple product specific elements. Nice. So incorporating that throughout the, the whole, like, sorry, in a dynamic fashion, depending on where they came from. Yeah. Because think about it. I don't care what got them. Like it, it's a math equation. I don't care what got them to my site or how they did it. Like as long as it's cost effective and then AOV backs out. So yeah. if that means I need to show them influencer, influencer, to product on white product on white, and then they buy, or it's just influencer to buy. I'm going to have to figure that out. And that's a constant, like, I guess that would be a really exciting thing to consistently do, which we do on a daily basis is understanding what is that initial entry point and then what do they show them next for them to buy? Yeah. And we're doing that right now with all of our lead gen, with all these, yeah. you know, try, we're going to put Greta's case study versus Shaq's case study head to head. See yeah. blonde versus brunette beard versus beauty. Yeah. How can, who is this going to work? Beard versus the beauty. Let's do it. <laughs> I like it. That sounds really good. Okay, so quickly, what can people expect from your talk at ECM, ECML? I know, I'm sure it's written. I'm sure it's a, it's fully ready now. But what can people basically talk expect from you know just just help sum up what they can expect from your talk in Barcelona and then the the mini course that we're working on as well. Oh well, the mini course is a really really good introduction into understanding how to think about retention and, and frequency of purchases. And I think it's going to be probably one of the biggest takeaways, right? And because Again, the industry is obsessed with acquisition. Nothing wrong with this, but if you once you see like the numbers I'm able to pull, once I show you the data behind it, you're gonna realize like a little bit applying a little bit of your focus into your already earned customers is gonna make your your um, not only your conversion rates increase, but it's gonna drive so much more revenue from you because the amount of dollars you have to spend to get them back in it is way less than cold traffic. So that's an introduction on the front side for the mini course. And on stage, I'm going to dive deeper into, A, how we scaled incrementally, or not incrementally, how we scaled um, very, very abruptly with the brand I mentioned earlier. And we're back recording and live. Okay, so from your talk on stage, you're going to dive deep? Yeah, we're going to dive deep on, on how we leverage influencers on Facebook at scale. Very cool. The one thing I'm going to try to do my best in getting it very clean is, making sure that you guys see the numbers between like why I would use it and when, at what point would I use it? And not only how do you negotiate to get that? That's probably the, the, the really biggest secret I'm going to go into is how we structure the deals to make sure that they want to contribute and play with us. One thing I hear people talking a lot about is how to entice people, how to get these, get, get on their radar. Like it's going to help, I guess it's, you know, coming from someone that looks like a polished agency, that's going to help. So, you know, like but what are the, like, one of the guys in our group was talking about how he's reached out to dozens of influencers and no one, no one gets back to him. Do you have, do you have any tips for people just to like, to get their foot in the door as more and more people leverage this to like stand apart? Oh, sending product straight up. Like as soon as you realize like, okay, I need this person to be a part of my brand. You are sending product because you can afford to give up a piece of something that's already created. And then for them to actually genuinely be about it, because here's what could happen when you've seen it happen before is as soon as they get the product and like, oh my God, this is amazing. They're going to do posts by themselves, yeah. right? So if you can get them out there and then you contact, hey, did you get my product? It's much easier way in rather than just pestering them because you know they're getting messages left and right. Yeah, and that, yeah, everyone likes getting stuff in the mail, no doubt. Amazon, all nice. day. Oh, you should see my house. It's a parade. It's ridiculous. Um, but okay, cool. So now I'll just put you on the spot one last time. Do you care about the World Cup? You're a former professional soccer goaltender. Do you care about the World yep. Cup? And and I'm who knows when this is going out here, but I want to see some prediction. I want to hear a prediction. Okay. So my short answer is yes, I care about the World Cup. I have to. That's my duty as a soccer player. But I'm actually more focused on positionally. Like I just want to make sure there's no more mistakes for goalkeepers because after watching the Spain game and having my boy De Gea really let that go and I was like, oh, I just hurt. Every single time something happens, part of me hurts. Um, I'm gonna make an early prediction and I'm gonna say the way Brazil played on their first game, everybody is firing on that team. Yeah. They look cool. So I'm, I'm very excited. Their path to, to the cup looks very good. Okay, you heard it here first. Shaq's going with Brazil. I'm gonna go, My I have an Irish, I have an Irish neighbor who says Belgium is looking strong this year and that's my dark horse pick. 
Okay. Okay. I'll agree with this. They're, I think they're steady. You obviously can go like the Germans are going to play yeah. well. Christian is carrying his team, but I'm going to go Brazil. You go Belgium. We'll see what nice. happens. Well, in the comments of this video, we want to see your predictions uh, for the World Cup uh, because it's obviously a big deal. It's going to be in Canada and and the U.S. and Mexico at the next one. So we'll have to go catch a game there. Maybe you'll be back in in top shape, ready to play. I think I'm going to I'm going to get the gloves back on. Definitely. Nice. Okay, great. Well, I can't wait for Barcelona. I can't wait to to get this. Uh, you know, have all these amazing things we're working on together come into light. And uh, couldn't be happening with a better person. So, so thanks for coming by, Nick. Thank you. Thank you guys for having me. Can't wait to see you guys in Barcelona. Okay, cheers.